lots of other species where you see males attempting, in the evolutionary sense, attempting to limit female access to other males. This is the whole world of copulatory plugs. Lots of dog canine related species where a semen plug is left there in the vagina of the female, which soon hardens into a plug and like nothing else is happening there. You see that. There are other cases. There are fly species where the male's penis is barbed and Ooh, I heard a... I'm not drawing that. <laughs> what are you thinking? Where it's barbed and where the barbs, in fact, go in the opposite direction, point back at the male. What's that? You get the penis in there and it's not coming out again. It's like one of those, you know, those you put your fingers... Okay. Well, it's actually not like one of those, but you get the point. And what's that about? The male leaves his penis in there, which he manages to do without afterward because they can make new ones. And this is a very different world you've got here. Then you've got the whole world we've already heard about, about sperm competition of sperm from one male and various fly species containing toxins that will kill the sperm of another male. Then there's a whole interesting world that goes on, which is when males fate, mate with a female, they do something biochemically which decreases the sexual attractiveness of the female subsequent to that. In a number of fly species, males with mating release a chemical which decreases mating pheromone production in the female and suddenly nobody else is interested in her. Or there are other fly species where males release a chemical which decreases sexual proceptivity in the female, viciously clever ways for males to control female rep reproductive behavior after they've left male-male competitive strategies. So what do you see at the female end of things? No surprise, you see female counter strategies. One brilliant one that evolved in humans is this relatively unique human phenomenon of hidden ovulation. Yes, all that pheromone stuff and smelling people's armpits and things that don't happen much in the real world, but what you see for the most part is that humans are not terribly aware of where somebody is in their cycle. Humans have invented hidden ovulation. What's that meant to do? Decrease paternity certainty. And one argument is, is that's a good mechanism for decreasing the likelihood of competitive infanticide. The other is, it decreases male attempt to control female sexual behavior because it's less clear when you need to be doing that. So counter strategies. More examples. This is argued that in some species that have non-reproductive sex throughout the cycle, that is a female counter strategy to again fool the male when ovulation is actually occurring, increasing the likelihood that at such time she can get somebody else's genes. Other strategies, we've already heard about one, whack in the competitive infanticide one, which is that whole world of females that can fake being an estrus, that go through pseudo-estrus, all of this meant to be ways of keeping males a little bit less certain of when they should be trying to control female sexual access, and thus she has more choice in the matter. What that brings us to is thus, oh, that's something interesting that I left out. Ah, it's not that interesting. Okay. So, back to male-male competition. This was first looking at male and lots of species, male attempts to regulate female sexual behavior, female counter strategies. What's up with male-male competition in terms of evolution and sexual behavior? Most obvious one being is male-male competition for reproductive access. And the standard old models being that linear access model, one female winds up with number one male, two, and so on. What that thus begins to explain is when you look at all social species out there, the leading cause of aggression is male-male aggression built around female access. And as we'll see by next week, that is the case as well for every human culture ever looked at. You also see, of course, the sperm competition. And once again, we have one of those issues with humans, which is where do we fit on the spectrum there? If you have monogamous species, Males tend to produce only small amounts of sperm and tend to have small testes. 
When you have polygamous species, males want to pump out insane amounts of sperm to increase the likelihood of outcompeting some other guy's sperm if it shows up on the scene, or for making a sperm plug and what you wind up getting there in those species are large testes. So you look at the various primates, and chimps have gigantic testicles per body size. Gorillas do not. Gorillas that have a very different world of male male comp. What about humans? Once again, the same exact thing. We are about halfway in between. When compared to other primates, we are intermediate between a tournament species and a pair bonding species in yet another domain. We've been hearing about this again and again. Something really interesting that has been shown in humans, which is, no, I'm not going to tell that. That's too hard to explain. But it was great. You would really wish. So now what we have is also looking at evolutionary aspects of female choice in there. And in what cases do you get female-female competition? 